Yeah. All right. <laughs> Today we're going to be talking about the number seven in scripture. And, you know, even though there's a lot of great stuff um, in this lesson, you know, I can't take credit for most of it. Um, a lot of it came from uh, E.W. Bullinger, Numbers in Scripture. You know, and we're gonna get into some of um, Ivan Panin, um, his work. I don't know if you guys heard of them guys, but you're gonna get familiarized with them today. And we're gonna see some very unique ways that the number seven is used in scripture. Amen. Yeah. You know, so um, we'll start off with uh, Genesis two, verses two and three. It says, on the seventh day, Elohim ended his work, which he made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had made. And Elohim blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he had rested from all his work, which Elohim created and made. Hallelujah. You know, so hereby we learn that number seven speaks to Elohim's end, God's rest, his blessedness and his sanctification of holiness. And so whenever you see the number seven, you know, it's going to have to do with one of these things, with Yah's end, with his rest, with his blessedness, or his holiness. You know, um, it's always going to represent that in some, type of, in some type of way. You know, but I also view the number seven simply as Yah's signature, his stamp or his seal, you know, um, how like today we sign off or something on something, you know, um, when you see the number seven or something in scripture, it's kind of like Yah's signature stamp or seal, you know, for the Yah is the progenitor, progenitor of these things. He's the progenitor, you know, of rest, blessedness, holiness, you know, um, and even the end of anything, you know, because no one can end what he started. Amen. No one can rest if he doesn't give it. None can bless outside of him blessing. You know, and none is made holy except through him. Amen. You know, so he's the progenitor of these things. So when we see these things, you know, um, we see the number seven, we should think of these things and we should think of, you know, this is Yah's way of signing off on something. Now, with this in mind, let us consider the first sentence of scripture, which has seven words mm. and 28 letters, mm. which is four times seven mm. or four sevens. I mean, you know, and so we see um, we have one word, bear sheep. You know, and then we have, sorry, oh, we have, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, 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 you know, so I view this as kind of like y'all just signing off saying, yes, this is my word that you're about to read. You're about to get into, you're about to get into my text. Yes, it is sacred. It is blessed. You know, and then it, you might find your rest. You know, your toil will come to an end. You know, another example can be found with the Ten Commandments, which were written with the very finger of Elohim himself, amen? Mm. So hence, on, on this piece of uh, passage, you would expect to find a signature, a stamp, or a seal anywhere else, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and it is actually there, you know, but you would think like, well, okay, a seven is a signature, why aren't there seven commandments? 
but they're 10, you know, and not seven. Nevertheless, Yah has put his unique signature, his stamp or his seal upon them for all to know that they are truly his and that they are divine. You know, so when we look at the Ten Commandments, we see um, that they start with verse 3, they end with verse 17. You know, verse 3 contains the first commandment and verse 17 contains the last. Now, within these Ten Commandments, the name of Yahuwah is used seven times. You know, um, can I have my first reader read? Uh, list of scriptures that's up there that speaks to this please thank you exodus 20 verse 5 thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them for yahuwah thy elohim is a, am a jealous elohim visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me verse 7 Thou shalt not take the name of Yahuwah thy Elohim in vain, for Yahuwah will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Verse 10, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of Yahuwah thy Elohim. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. Verse 11, for in six days Yahuwah made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore, Yahuwah blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. And verse 12, honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which Yahuwah thy Elohim giveth thee. Hallelujah. So we see here that Yah truly did sign off on his Ten Commandments. He did sign it. His name occurs seven times in it, showing that they are truly his. Amen? Amen. But that's not it. There's more. <laughs> yeah. Yah is the light. We're told this in John 1, 15. And in them is, there is no darkness. Amen? And he called the light day in Genesis 1, 5. Therefore, if he's the light and he called the light day, it can be argued or said that Yah also can be called day, seeing that he is the light. And it's no wonder that the Hebrew word yom or day occurs seven times within the Ten Commandments. Let me have my next reader read Exodus 20, verses 8 through 12, please. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of Yahuwah thy Elohim. In it thou shalt do not do any work, thou nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days Yahuwah made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and all them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore Yahuwah blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which Yahuwah thy Elohim giveth thee. Hallelujah. Yeah. And so you see, within here, you know, Yah signs off on, on it again, this time as the day, you know, and day represents light. Amen. Yeah. You know, because he called the light day, you know, and now you understand why you see, you know, throughout scripture where it speaks of Torah as a light or a lamp unto thy feet. You know, this is one of the ways the I signed off, off on, again, showing that he's the author of these Ten Commandments. Amen. And that's not it. There's more. Seven of the Ten Commandments begin with the Hebrew word lo or not. You know, and we find these in Exodus 24 through 17. It says, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them, for I, Yahuwah, thy Elohim, am 
a jealous Elohim, visiting the iniquity of thy fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me and show mercy unto the unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. See that? Did you take notice that loving him is associated with keeping his commandments? Yes. This is why you see in John 14, 15, Yahshua said, saying, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Mm -hmm. um, but I digress. Verse 7. <laughs> Thou shalt not take the name of Yahuwah thy Elohim in vain, for Yahuwah will not hold him guiltless that take of his name in vain. And again, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, thou shalt not covet his na thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his behind, or anything that is thy neighbor's. Hallelujah. So here it is. He's signing off on what you should not do. Amen. You know, and there are also seven types of persons or animals in which Yah forbade to do work on the Sabbath. Against Exodus 20, 10, and 11. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of Yahuwah, thy Elohim, and in it thou shalt not do any work. Thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is um, within thy gates for in six days Yahuwah made heaven and earth to see and all that is in them and rested the seventh day wherefore Yahuwah blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So we see we have thyself, sons, daughters, manservants, maidservants, cattle, stranger. Seven. You know, also Yah gave seven prohibitions concerning the covenant of one's neighbor. You know, uh, which spoke to covering his house, his wife, manservant, maidservant, ox, behind, or anything that is thy neighbor's. Again, he's putting his signature right upon his text that he wrote with his own finger. Amen. Amen. Yahuwah put his uh, signature or stamp or seal on Abraham. By giving him a sevenfold blessing. Mm -hmm. And we find this in Genesis 1, 20, um, Genesis 12, 1 through 3. My next reader, please. Now Yahuwah said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy great thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and all and thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. All right, so we see the sevenfold blessing. You know, he will make of Abraham a great nation. He will bless him. He will make his name great. Not only will he bless them, but he shall be a blessing. And he will bless them that bless him. And he'll curse them that curse them. And in him shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Sevenfold. You know, again, showing that that is his covenant. It ends with him. You know, Yahuwah did likewise with the covenant he made with Abraham, Yisak, and Yaakov. In that he told Israel seven things he'd do because of that covenant with their forefathers. This is found in Exodus 6, 6 through 8. My next reader, please. Wherefore say unto the children of Israel, I am Yahuwah, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will rid you out of their bondage, and I will redeem you with a stretched out arm and with great judgments, and I will take you to, and I will take you to me for a people, and I will be to you a Elohim, and ye shall know that I am Yahuwah, your Elohim, which bringeth you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, 
and I will bring you into the land concerning the which did I swear to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, and I will give to you for an heritage. I am Yahuwah. Okay, so we see he will do seven things. I will, I will, I will, I will, I will, I will, I will. You know, again, signing off on, on, on his promises. You know, in the book of Psalms, there are seven names mentioned within the titles. There's David and Psalms 3 and others. Uh, David actually, you know, wrote 56 of, uh, of, of the Psalms. You know, the sons of Korah, you know, um, who wrote Psalms 42 and, and some others, 11 in total. Asaph, Psalms, who wrote Psalms 50 and, and some others, 12 in total. We have Haman, the Ezraite, you know, who's responsible for Psalms 88, and Ethan, the Ezraite, responsible for Psalms 89. We have Moshe for Psalms 90, Solomon, Psalms 72. You know, seven, seven names that are mentioned within the titles of the Psalms, thereby, you know, showing the holiness of the Psalms, you know, y'all signing off on them. Something else that's interesting is that we learned that David is by far the largest contributor to the book of Psalms, even having y'all's signature stamp, stamp or seal upon um, his seven, his number seven upon his contribution of 56 Psalms, which is eight sevens. Now that said, David's writings are further signed and stamped and sealed of Yah, and that there are seven psalms attributed to him in the brick common shine. So in the New Testament, you'll find seven psalms, you know, um, that's that they're quoting from, from David. You know, the first one's found in Acts 4:25, where it says, Who by the mouth of thy servant David has said. Why did the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things, which is a quote from Psalms 2? Then we have Acts 2.25. For David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Adonai always before my face, for he is on my right hand, that I should not be moved. And this is a quote from Psalm 16. Then we have Romans 4.6. Even David also described with the blessedness of the man unto whom Elohim imputed righteousness without words. This is a quote from Psalms 32. Then we have Acts 116. Men and brethren, this scripture must needs have been fulfilled, which Ruach HaKodesh by the mouth of David spake before concerning Yahudas, which was a guide to them that took Yahushua. Quoting from Psalms 41. Then we have Romans 11, 9 and 10. And David saith, let their table be made a snare and a trap and a stumbling block and a recompense unto them. Let their eyes be darkened that they may not see and bow down their back always. A quote from Psalm 69. Then we have Hebrews 4, 7. It says, again, he limited a certain day, saying in David, today, after so long a time as it is said, Today, if ye will hear my voice, hearten not your hearts. A quote from Psalm 95. And then, lastly, we have Matthew 22, 42 through 44, saying, What think ye of Mashiach? Whose son is he? They say unto him, the son of David. He saith unto them, How then do of David in spirit call him Adonai, saying, Yahuwah said unto my Adonai, sit thou on my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. Quote from Psalms 109. You know, and so we see these seven uh, quotes from Psalms attributed to David. Again, Yah signing off. Take note that three of these quotations occur within the Pauline epistles and three occur in the book of Acts, with only one of them occurring in a gospel, virtually putting Yah seven 
that is your signature stamp or seal upon the 12 apostles, their acts, and the apostle uh, Paul's uh, epistles, i.e. the whole great Kadasha. You know, because Apostle Paul wrote much of it, his apostles wrote, wrote the others, and then we have the book of Acts. You know, so you, we see, again, Yah signing off on his word. Now, check this out. Out of the seven Psalms quoted in the Brick Kanasha, one is actually quoted seven times. And that is Psalm 69. You know, so David is the only author of the Psalms that's quoted seven times in the Brick Kanasha or the New Testament writings. And within those um, New Testament writings, the Brick Kanasha, one of his psalms is quoted seven times, and that's Psalm 69. So how important is he saying this psalm is? <laughs> Amen? <laughs> Can you see that? Can you see him signing off on this? Like, hey, y'all, hey, 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 check this one out. This one right here. They are good, but this one right here. Amen? <laughs> you know, Let's see, the first time is um, Psalm 69, 4, you know, where it says, they that hate me without a cause are more than the hairs of my head. They that would destroy me, being my enemies wrongfully, are mighty. Then I restored um, that which I took not away. And this is quoted in Yoganah 15, 18 through 25, my next reader, please. If the world hated you, hates you, Ye know that it hated me before it hated you. If ye were of the world, the world would love his own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Remember the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my sayings, they will keep yours also. But all these things will do unto you for my name's sake, because they know not him that sent me. If I had not come and stolen, they had not had sin, but no, but now they have no cloak for their sin. He that hateth me hateth my father also. If I had not done among them the works which none other man did, they had not had sin. But now, but now have they both seen and hated both me and my father. But this cometh to pass, that the word might be fulfilled that is written in their law. They hated me without a cause. Hallelujah. All right, and saying that this psalm is so, so important that it's, it's been singled out, I think, you know, we need to really take heed to the things that were quoted, you know? And so if we really walk this thing out in spirit and in truth, we can expect to be hated. Yep. Amen? Mm -hmm. We can expect the world to hate us even as it hated Yahshua, even as it hated his apostles and all his followers. Amen? Mm -hmm. So, if the world not hating on you, <laughs> say la. <laughs> then we have Psalm 69, 9. It says, for the zeal of thine house have eaten me up, and the reproaches of them that reproach of thee are falling upon me. You know, and this was this is uh quoted in Yochanan 2 13 through 17. My next reader, please. And the Jews' Passover was at hand, and Yeshua went up to Jerusalem and found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves, and the changers of money sitting. When he had made a scourge of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changer's money and overthrew the tables, said unto them that sold the doves, Take these hence, make not my father's house and house of merchandise. And his disciples remembered that it was written, The zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, and let that, that be a stern warning, you know, to, you know, to the house of Elohim. Amen. Amen. 
Then we have, thirdly, we have Tehillim 69.21. It says, they gave me also gall, excuse me, gall for my meat. And in my thirst, they gave me vinegar to drink. You know, and this is quoted in Matthew 27, 33, and 34. And when they would come unto a place called Golgotha, that is to say, a place of a skull, they gave him vinegar and drink mingled with gall. And when he had tasted thereof, he would not drink. Mm. You know, and also, um, and not the Yahoo 27, 47 through 49. Some of them that stood there, when they heard that, said, this man <coughs> calleth for Elijah. And straightway, one of them ran and took a sponge and filled it with vinegar and put it on a reed and gave him a drink. The rest said, let it, let be, let us see if Elijah will come to save him. Yeah, you missed the ball, right? Mm -hmm. Then we have verses 22 and 23 of Tehillim 69. It says, let their table become a snare before them, and that which should have been for their welfare, let it become a trap. Let their eyes be darkened, mm -hmm. that they see not, and make their loins continually to shake. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, and this is quoted in Romans 11, 7 through 10, my next reading, please. What then, Israel, have not obtained that which ye seek it for? But the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. According as it is written, Elohim hath given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear, unto this day. And David, say, David saith, Let their table be made a spare, and a trap, and a stumbling block, and a recompense among them. Let their eyes be darkened that they may not see and bow down their back away. Hallelujah. Uh, you know, so we know their table will be made a snare and a trap. Their eyes will be darkened. And so we can expect them not to get what we're saying. Mm -hmm. Amen. Say yeah. Verse 24 um, and 27. You know, pour out thine indignation upon them and let thy wrathful anger take hold of them. And also, Psalm 69, 27, add iniquity unto their iniquity and let them not come into thy righteousness. Mm -hmm. You know, and this is entailed in 1 Thessalonians 2, 14 through 16. My next reader, please. For ye know that the Jews are not Judea are in Messiah Yeshua, for ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews who both killed the Adonai Yeshua and their own prophets and have persecuted us. And they please not Elohim in our con con contrary to all men, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be safe, safe to fill of their sins so always. For the wrath is come upon them to the uttermost. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So we see that it was prophesied in Psalm 69 that they, they would suffer, that the followers of Yahshua would suffer, you know, so that Yah would pour out his indignation upon the wicked and let his wrath and anger take hold of them. You know, hence he will add iniquity unto their iniquity. You know, also we see this in uh, Psalm 69, 25 and 27, let their habitation be desolate and let none dwell in their tents. And verse 27 again, add iniquity unto their iniquity and let them not come into thy righteousness. Um, and this can be seen in Matthew 23, 32 through 38. My next reader, please. Fill ye up then the measure of your faith, and increase 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 Wherefore, behold, I send unto you prophets and wise men and scribes. Some of them ye shall kill and crucify, 
Some of them ye shall scourge in your synagogues, persecute them from city to city, that upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth, from the blood of righteous Abel unto the blood of Zechariah, son of Barakai, whom ye slew between the temple and the altar. Verily I say unto you, all these things shall come upon this generation. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. Behold, your house is left desolate unto you. Hallelujah. So we also see uh, there that was the seventh one. And I could go on and on and on and on with the number seven. It, it occurs in so many places, so many ways throughout scripture, you know. But I'll leave you with this true story that sums it up perfectly. You know, this story is about Ivan Panik, who was born in Russia on December 12, 1855. As a young man, he participated in plots against the Khazar. And as a result, he was exiled from Russia. After studying in Germany, he immigrated to the United States, where he entered Harvard University in 18, 1878 and graduated four years later with a Bachelor of Arts. After graduation, he became a lecturer on Russian literature. He was also a firm agnostic. So much so that when he became a Christian, newspapers carried the headlines about his conversion. His conversion. In, in 1890, Dr. Panin made his discovery of what he believed to be the mathematical substructure of the Greek New Testament. For some months preceding you know, uh, Sunday, November 19th, 1899, the, the New York Sun had been devoting the better part of a page of the Sunday edition to the discussion of the truth of Christianity. On that date, it printed a letter from one WRL in which he, he denounced Christianity using the old off-refuted arguments and challenged some champion of orthodoxy to come into the arena of the sun and give its readers some facts in defense of the religious on um, the Christian religion. The following letter met that challenge. The letter was reprinted by the writer himself, which is Ivan Panin, in a pamphlet of some 50 pages with the Greek text of Matthew Yahoo 1, 1 through 17, and the vocabularies there too, enabling the scholarly reader to verify his statements for himself. This is Ivan, Dr. Ivan Panin's letter to the New York Sun. Mm -hmm. Sir, in today's Sun, Mr. W.R.L. calls for a champion or orthodoxy to step into the arena of the sun and give them some facts. Here are some facts. The first 17 verses of the New Testament contain the genealogy of Messiah. It consists of two main parts. Verses 1 through 11 cover the period from Abraham to the, um, to the father of the chosen people to the captivity when they ceased as an independent people. Verses 12 through 17 cover the period from the captivity to the promised deliverer, the Messiah, let us examine the first part of this geology, genealogy. Its vocabulary has 49 words, or seven times seven. This number is itself seven, seven sevens. Um, and the sum of its factors is two sevens. Of these 49 words, 28 or four sevens began with a vowel. And 21 or three sevens begin with a consonant. Again, these 49 words of the vocabulary have 266 letters or seven times two times 19. This number is itself 38 sevens. The sum of its factors is 28 or four sevens. Feature number six, while the sum of its figures is 14 or two sevens, which is feature number seven of these 266 letters, moreover 140 or 20 sevens are vowels and 126 or 18 sevens are consonants. Mm -hmm. Feature number eight. That is to say, just as the number of words in the vocabulary is a multiple of seven, so is the number of its letters a multiple of seven. 
just as the sum of the factors of the number of the words is a multiple of seven. So is the sum of the factors of the number of their letters a multiple of seven. And just as the number of words is divided between vowels, vowel words and consonant words by seven, so is their number of letters divided between vowels and consonants by seven. Again, of these 49 words, 35 or five sevens occur more than once in the passage, and 14 or two sevens occur but, but once. Seven occur in more than one form, and 42 or six sevens occur in only one form. And among the parts of speech, the 49 words are thus divided, 42 or six sevens are nouns. Seven are not nouns. Of the nouns, 35 or five sevens are proper names. Seven are proper nouns. Of the proper names, 28 are male ancestors of Messiah and seven are not. Moreover, these 49 words are distributed alphabetically. Thus under A through E are 21 in number or three sevens. Um, Z through K, 14 or two sevens. M through X also 14. No other groups of sevens stopping at the end of a letter are made by these 49 words. The groups of sevens stop with these letters and no others. But the letters A, E, Z, K, M, X are letters 1, 5, 6, 10, 12, 22 of the Greek alphabet. And the sum of these numbers called their place values is 56 or eight sevens. This enumeration of the numeric phenomena of these 11 verses does not begin to be exhaustive, but enough has been said, has been shown to make it clear that this part of the genealogy is constructed on an elaborate design of sevens. The New Testament is written in Greek. The Greeks had no separate symbols for expressing numbers corresponding to our Arabic figures, but used instead the letters of their alphabet, just as the Hebrews in whose language the Old Testament is written. Um, may use for the same purpose of theirs. According to the 24 Greek letters, um, stand for the following numbers. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80. Um, I guess they're probably 90, 100, one, uh, no, 80, and then 100, 200, 300, 400, 500, 600, 700, 800. Every Greek word is thus a sum in arithmetic obtained by adding the numbers for which its letters stand or the numeric values. Now the vocabulary of the entire genealogy has 72 words. If we write its numeric value over each of these 72 words and add them, we get their sum, which is 42,364 or 6,052 sevens. Distributed into the following alphabetical groups, only A through B have 9,821 or 1,403 sevens. G through D, G through D have 1,904 or 272 sevens. 3703 or 3,703 or 529 sevens. TH through R has 19,264 or 2,752 sevens. A through X 7,672 or 1,096 sevens. But the numeric value of the 10 letters used for making these groups um, is 931 or seven times seven times 19, a multiple not only of seven, but seven sevens. How do you like that? Let Mr. WRL try to write some 300 words intelligently like this genealogy and reproduce some numeric phenomena of like designs. If he does, if he does it in six months, he will indeed do a wonder. Let us assume that Matt, Matthew accomplished this feat in one month. The second part of this um, chapter, verses 18 through 25, relates to the birth of Messiah. It consists of 161 words or 23 sevens, occurring in 105 forms or 15 sevens, with a vocabulary of 77 words or 11 sevens. Joseph is spoken to here by the angel according of the 77 words, the angel used 28 or four sevens. Of the 105 forms, he uses 35 or five sevens. The numeric value of the vocabulary is 52,605 or 7,515 sevens. 
of the form 65,429 or 9,347s. This enumeration only begins as it were to barely scratch the surface of the numerics of this passage. But what is especially noteworthy here is the fact that the angel's speech has also a scheme of sevens, making it a kind of ring within a ring, a will within a will. If Mr. L can write a similar passage of 161 words with the same scheme of sevens alone, though there was there are seven several others here, in some three years he would accomplish a still greater wonder. Let us assume that Matthew accomplished this feat in only six months. His third point is the second chapter of Matthew tells of the childhood of Messiah. Its vocabulary has 161 words or 23 sevens with 896 letters or 128 sevens and 238 forms or 34 sevens. The numeric value of the vocabulary is 123,529 or 17,647 sevens of the forms 1,166,985 or 23,855 sevens, and so on through the pages of enumeration. This chapter has at least four logical divisions. Each division shows one shows alone the same phenomena found in the whole in the chapter as a whole. Thus, the first six verses have a vocabulary of 56 words or eight sevens, etc. There are some speeches here. Um, Herod speaks, the Magi speak, the angel speaks, but so pronounced are the numeric phenomena here that though there were as were um, as though as as though are there are as it were numerous rings within rings and wheels within wheels. Each is perfect in itself, though forming all the while only a uh, part of the rest. If Mister L can write a chapter like this as naturally as Matthew writes, but containing in some 500 words, so many intertwined yet harmonious numeric features and say the rest of his days, whatever his age now, or the one to which he is to attain, if he does accomplish it at all, it will, be in, it will indeed be a marvel of marvels. Let us assume that Matthew accomplished this feat in only three years. Point number four, there is not However, a single paragraph of the scores in Matthew that is not constructed in exactly the same manner. Only with each additional paragraph, the difficulty of constructing it increases not in arithmet um, arithmetical or in geometrical um, progression, for he contrives to write numeric relations to what goes before and after. Thus, in his last chapter, he contrives to use seven words not used by him before. It would thus be easy to show that Mr. L will inquire some centuries to write a book like Matthew. How long it took Matthew to write the, um, the writer does not know, but how he contrived to do it between the crucifixion at AD 30 and his gospel could not have been written earlier and the destruction of, the, of Jerusalem at, at AD 70 and the gospel could not have been written later. Let Mr. L and his like-minded explain. Anyhow, Matthew did it, and we thus have a miracle, an unheard of literary, mathematical artist, unequaled, hardly even conceivable. This is the first fact for Mr. L to contemplate. A second fact is yet more important. In this very first section, the genealogy discussed above the words found nowhere else in the New Testament occurs 42 times, seven times six and have 126 letters, which is seven times six times three, each number of multiple, not only of seven, but of six sevens, to name only two other many numeric features of, this, of these words. But how did Matthew know when designing this, this scheme for these words, whose sole characteristic is that they are found nowhere else in the New Testament, that they would not be found in the other 26 books, that they would not be used by the other seven New Testament writers. Unless we assume the impossible hypothesis, he had an agreement with them to that effect. He must have had the rest of the New Testament before him when he wrote his book. The Gospel of Matthew then was written last. Point number five. 
It so happens, however, that the Gospel of Mark shows the very same phenomenon. Mm. Thus, the very passage called so triumphantly in today's son, a forgery, the last 12 verses of Mark presents among some 60 features of sevens, the following phenomena, it has 175 words or 95 sevens, a vocabulary of 98 words or two sevens of sevens with 553 letters or 79 sevens, 133 forms or 19 sevens, and so on to the minutest detail. Mark then is another miracle, uh, another unparalleled literary genius. And in the same way in which it is shown that Matthew wrote last, it is also shown that Mark too wrote last. Thus, to take an example from this passage, it has just one word found nowhere else in the New Testament, deadly. That's the word. This fact is signaled by no less than seven features of, of seven. Thus, its numeric value is 581 or 83 sevens. With the sum of its figures, 14 or two sevens, of which the letters 357 from both the beginning and end of the word have 490 or seven times seven times five times two, a multiple of seven sevens. With the sum of its factors, 21 or three sevens, in the vocabulary, it is preceded by 42 words, seven times six. In the passage itself, by 126 words, or seven times six times three, both numbers are uh, multipliers, not only of seven, but of six sevens. We have thus established before us this third fact for Mr. L to contemplate. Matthew surely wrote after Mark, and Mark just as surely wrote after Matthew. <laughs> Point number six, it happens, however, to be a fourth fact that Luke presents the same phenomenon as Matthew and Mark, and so does John and James, and Peter and Jude and Paul, and we have thus no longer two great unheard of mathematical literature, but eight of them, and each wrote after the other. And not only this, as Luke and Peter wrote each two books, John 5, Paul uh, 14, it can in the same way be shown that each of the 27 Testament books was written last. In fact, not a page of the over 500 in Westcott and Horst Greek edition, which the writer has used throughout, but it 